Good morning, everyone. Um, this is the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs, and we are picking up our work on the uh, miscellaneous uh, ethics bill. Uh, this is the draft request 240229, um, and we're here to Take a look at draft 3.2, which I think Tim has been working diligently on to capture some of our thoughts from last week. So uh, Tim, thanks for walking us through the new draft. You're very welcome, Chair McCarthy. Thank you very much for having me. For the record, my name is Tim Dublin, Legislative Council. The committee will have uh, access to um, draft 3.2, as well as an updated uh, bill summary of draft 3.2. And like last time, the bill summary uh, indicates the changed material in green font. And uh, Chair McCarthy, would you like me to just kind of uh, jump um, straight into where things have uh, changed since the last version or? Do you know what I think we should probably do? Because we haven't kind of, we've been working on a ton of different stuff in here and I think it might be helpful uh, to, to talk first about what are the changes that you've done for this draft. So we'll go through the summary and then take the time to actually walk through the, the language at a job where we can skip stuff that we've really talked about before, but kind of see it in context. So if that, that'll give us, I think, a summary first. Yeah, so we'll start with the summary. If um, Tim, if you can highlight the changes and then we'll go back and look at them in context yeah. just to kind of see. What I'd like to do today for the committee is identify areas where we've kind of think that we may have gotten to a good place and then identify areas where, you know, folks still have high level concern or questions that we want to address and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. That sounds good. Well, and I should also note for the committee's attention that uh, in draft 3.2, all the updated text appears highlighted. So I can mm -hmm. quickly uh, skim through to find exactly what's been changed. So in section one, um, version uh, draft 3.2, um, let's see, updates some language having to do with the candidate disclosure, uh, candidate financial disclosure requirements, specifically the loans um, that uh, are to be required, uh, sorry, that are to be disclosed by a candidate uh, if was, loans are made to a company, if the candidate owned more than 10% of that company, and if the loan was not commercially reasonable and made in the ordinary course of business. And so a definition has been uh, inserted here to define what that, uh, what would be a loan that's not commercially reasonable or made in the ordinary course of business, or should I say, that is those things. And that is um, a loan that is made A, in the usual manner on any recognized uh, market, B, at any price current in any recognized market, at the time of making the loan or C, otherwise in conformity with reasonable commercial practices among lenders typically dealing in the type of loan made. Okay. The next update, you can find this on, let's see, page four of the summary. This is in the part of the bill pertaining to the expansion of State Ethics Commission's powers, specifically in section nine, which has to do with the procedure for accepting and referring complaints um, prior to this, the Section 9 had just been renamed, um, the title of it, that is, to be more factually descriptive. This now includes, um, let's see, a further amendment uh, requiring that any entity receiving a ref um, referred complaint from the Commission shall consult with the Commission regarding the application of the State Code of Ethics to facts presented in the complaint. And for context, this is uh, in situations where the current, under current law, um, the State Ethics Commission serves as a clearinghouse and redirects uh, complaints to um, certain entities that uh, actually will handle the matter. And so this would require kind of uh, once uh, the other entity receives the complaint, have a check back or really an upfront um, consultation to make sure uh, that the state code of ethics is being followed properly. The next section of the bill that's been updated is section 10, can we do with the new investigatory power. And this uh, amends a few things. Uh, let's see. Uh, this section overall enables the commission to investigate alleged unethical conduct occurring within the prior two years with or without receiving a complaint. 
Investigations must conclude within now six months. It was three months before and may result in an investigative uh, investigation report and subsequent commission hearing if there is a reasonable basis. And I just changed some of the terminology from probable cause to reasonable basis. Same uh, um, thing, just uh, for your little bit uh, more common parlance there, uh, maybe more easily digestible by folks reading this. And um, let's see, and then also added is that investigations and subsequent hearings may be initiated only by a majority of the members present voting affirmatively for that to happen. The next section of the bill that's been updated is section 12. And this is to add, in addition to the warnings, reprimands, reprimands or recommendations, recommended actions that the commission can issue, um, this would enable the commission to enter into uh, agreements um, with the public servant, what I've just termed here as resolution agreements, just kind of made up that term if the committee would like something um, else, happy to change that. And these resolution agreements can be entered into uh, by the commission uh, with the public servant at any point in time before or during the proceedings, which will pause any pending deadlines, but require a three month check back uh, from the commission to ensure compliance with that agreement. Section 13, and this has to do with the procedure and rulemaking. Um, let's see, the, here this would require two thirds of the commission's members present in voting uh, in order to waive the application of any rule. And then it also grants the commission, uh, now the executive director and commission's legal counsel and investigators power to issue subpoena and administer votes in connection with any investigation or hearing. And so that's just a clarification language um, that um, as to who can actually issue those um, subpoenas, not just the commission, but certain uh, involved staff working for the commission. Well, yeah, we have section 14 has to do with um, records and confidentiality. And under the previous draft, we saw that public records were linked to the commission's handling of complaints, including alleged uh, unethical conduct, investigations and proceedings are exempt from the Public Records Act and shall be kept confidential as a starting place. And then there's exceptions to that being one investigation reports um, where a hearing is found to be warranted, two, and this is new, investigation reports relating to alleged unethical co uh, conduct determined to not warrant a hearing. Um, however, if uh, requested by the public servant, that can be made public. And then let's see, also the resolution agreements would be exempt, um, sorry, they'd be exempt to the exemption, meaning they would be public and not necessarily confidential. Representative Meek. Uh, I think this is a picky thing, or yes. maybe I just don't understand, but it sounds like the second warranted and that number two may not be warranted. Well, maybe a typo there. On the um, oh, uh, grammatical yeah. or, or, uh, uh, summary. Sorry. Is it just on the summary, or did you say oh, yeah, just on the summary? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> let's okay, uh, okay. When we go through the draft. Let's just double check that it's. <laughs> Tim, Tim's usually like eagle eye on, on the <laughs> on the draft itself. <laughs> In my experience. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Nugent. Um, I'll make sure to update that and double check the draft too to make sure that's copacetic. And let's see, the last part of the bill that's been altered here in draft 3.2 are the effective dates. And now there's essentially three rollout periods. Um, the first being Sections that will take effect on passage is the majority of them. Uh, sections two through five regarding in-office financial disclosure requirements. Section six regarding delinquent disclosures for candidates and state office, in office state of Senate and state representative. Section 13 regarding the state ethics commission's new rulemaking authority. Section 15 regarding state ethics commission's membership. Section 16 and 17 regarding state ethics commission staffing. Section 18 regarding the citation correction. Uh, section 19 regarding ethics data collection. Those will all uh, take effect upon passage. The next rollout period is January 1st, 2025. And this is for sections seven through 12 and 14 regarding the State Ethics Commission's expansion of powers, excluding rulemaking authority. 
which would go into effect uh, earlier. And then the last rollout period is January 1st, 2026. This is section one regarding the candidate financial disclosure requirements. And uh, those are all the updates for now. Okay, a bunch of cans. So represent Hooper is in your wiki. So <clears throat> including the change, this will be six voting members. Uh, yes, be an even number. And a couple of times in here, it's referenced a majority of its present mm -hmm. uh, can do something. So if there are two pairs of people present, there's no quorum requirement in that noticed there is a default quorum requirement uh, via majority of uh committee members who need to be present to set a formal quorum so then to take an action you still have to have a majority of the six to take to let's see um action being um approved of initiating an investigation or that was one of the spots i saw uh, hearing would require a majority of those present and voting, that majority assumes there's a quorum existing already. So at least four, four people, assuming the additional members added. So coming up from there. So Representative Moe Gaddis, same for two. A generic good. question. Sure. Um, there's a, a place in here where uh, there's language that suggests, um, it talks about the burden of proof being preponderance of evidence. What are, can you remind me the, what are the three levels of burden of proof? Oh, sure. Um, there are um, actually more, but many. And we typically see this um, criminal uh, standards, and there's also uh, standards for uh, civil proceedings. Um, let's see. Um, try to remember all the time. Oh, there's, there's, yeah. there's beyond a reasonable doubt, there's um, on a certain evidence and criminal and then uh, clear and convincing evidence is another one. So um, what the number is the providence of evidence? Sure, I believe that would be kind of a 50% threshold. Okay. Let me double check that though real quickly because I this is one of those things I can't recall it's not my head. And clear and convincing is higher than that and yes, I believe so. And Again, I apologize. It's and been I, since uh, I've heard I've this many times that. and it hasn't stuck. So, um, yeah, so preponderance of evidence would be um, uh, a burden that convinces the fact finder that there's greater than 50% chance the claim is true. And then, and that's just one of uh, a variety of evidential, okay. evidentiary standards. Um, and I believe that is the default uh, in. Yes, that is the standard in most civil cases. Okay. Senator um, Going back to the commission structure, did you say that it was, <clears throat> excuse me, six members? It will be. It will, or it will be. Yes. This bill, it's currently five. This proposes out of six uh, representatives to be appointed by the uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Is there a tie break mechanism in here? No. So they got to get to a 6 4 to move anything. It's going to be 4 of 6. Yeah. I'm sorry. Assuming so that all, all, all are present. Yeah. Wow. That, that was bad math. <laughs> Apologies for that little hiccup. But yes, yeah. you understand what I'm saying. There needs, so there needs to be a plurality yeah, you, with, a, with an, an even number, number of members. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This is sort of true that. Any other questions from the summary before we see it all out in the wild? All right, so I think what we should do is turn our attention to the draft itself and see what all of this looks like in context. And I imagine that may spark a few questions. I know I asked some, but we wanted to. So the first change uh, and the bill is um, some of the, uh, the statement of purpose has been updated. Purely material. Uh, first change can be found on page six. And this has been highlighted. This is the addition of the definition of what is a commercially reasonable loan made in the ordinary course of business. And uh, sorry, just for clarification, Chair McCarthy, is this how you'd like me to proceed? Just kind of bounce with the highlights or? 
actually really um, uh, perform a section by section walk. Yeah, I think if we if we can just go section by section, I, I just I know the committee has been really bounce around with a whole bunch of different topics. And I just want to make sure we're all kind of oriented into like what is in the draft. We've been through a few drafts. We've been doing this kind of doing a heavy session on this about once a week now for the, <laughs> the session. And now that we're kind of, I think that if the way I would describe this draft is we're like in the 90% done range, I think. Um, and, and I think there's been an attempt to address a lot of the concerns that kind of were flagged by various members of the, the committee. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I know that um, Director Sivert's been working with you, Tim, on trying to flush out what was somewhat vague procedural language around the, the investigatory powers. So what I'd like to do is kind of take a look at just the highlights of what, what is in the disclosure form, mm -hmm. make sure we're looking at the disclosure amounts, hitting those areas where we talked about like uh, for the self-employed folks, I know Representative Higley had brought up a couple questions about that, and we've made some changes. Um, the I just wanted to make sure folks are aware that we're not asking for the amounts on individual stock holding. So I don't want to just breeze through the disclosure and make sure folks kind of see where we've done some modifications there over the last couple of drafts. Um, and then we can spend more time really going through line by line on the investigatory pieces because those have changed a lot without us as a committee really focusing as much. Uh, that uh, that seems like something you can help us with, Tim. I sure. think that would be the most useful for the committee. Absolutely. So a recap of the first part of the bill being Section 1 having to do with candidate financial disclosure requirements. Um, this is Section uh, subsection A. It will require the following disclosures. Uh, to include one source of personal income of more than $5,000 from an employer. This is current law. Two, if self-employed, sources of personal income from, and then we have two items. A, the name of any client whom the candidate knows has had business before any municipal or state office, department, or agency during the previous 12 months, provided that the disclosed information is not confidential information. B, if self-employed, sources of personal income um, from then uh, include the names of clients from whom the candidate has received $10,000 or more in the previous 12 months, provide that the disclosed information is not confidential information. So um, I'm going to stop there and think about for a second some of the conversation we've been having around uh, dis disclosing clients. So I think we've been trying to balance. We want to know, we, we, we want to have disclosure be consistent across the board with where people's income is coming from. Um, so the folks are, are making a good faith disclosure. And um, I'm wondering if, if this captures the, the discussion. So the first part um, at the bottom of so in line 18, we're saying if the candidate is self-employed, they have to describe the nature of the self-employment. So they might say, you know, I'm an attorney and I have to disclose then in, in Romanet I, the names of clients that are known to me or, or my domestic partner or spouse's clients to have had business before a municipality or a state. And then separately, they have to disclose any client from whom the client or their spouse or domestic partner has received $10,000 or more. So that's the way it's constructed right now is anybody who's had business for the state that you know, and then any client $10,000 or more. And I'm wondering if that's where we want to hit. And I'll probably come back to that when Representative Higley's here, but I just wanted to flag that as that's one area where I was about to say he's concerned about that. Yeah, it? where the, the disclosure of the names of, of all of the clients, as opposed to saying, you know, I'm a contractor and in my business, you know, so my business is being a contractor and not naming all of the individual clients and sort of how, what level of specificity we need. Um, Cause I know Representative Hango and Representative Piggly both talked about that. Um, quite a bit. So I just want to flag that uh, Romanet 2, we might need to 
make an adjustment there in the next draft to, <clears throat> to address those concerns. Go ahead. Okay, just has just a situational clarification on this, right? So that could be a real estate broker who sells a home to a somebody involved in state government or candidate in that community is in excess of 10 grand on like a single home sale. I mean, because they're they're all, I mean, in that in that realm, they're all subcontractors, right? They're all their own little independent LLCs. I think I think what, what I'm trying to to really think about here is we're trying to say in statute what things we want to ask for on a form. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if we're saying to a candidate, report any clients that you that are known to you to have had business before the state and report any clients that have had that have paid you ten thousand dollars or more. That seems pretty clear. I think it's going to be up to the to some interpretation, depending on the particulars of your industry. If you're making a good faith disclosure to say like, okay, well, I work for this particular real estate firm. I happen to have a commission that was $16,000. Mm -hmm. Do I report just that I have a commission from a sale that's from my real estate firm that I work for as an independent contractor or something like that? Or is that, um, or do I need to report the name of the particular client? Right. So that that's the, the the question that I think we might want to come back to with yeah. TJ and Chris of like, what are we really asking for people to report and what's important? Because it's like, do you report the sum or do you report the client or do you report the fact that it's in excess of? It's not the sum. Yeah. It's so okay. Yeah, it's not the sum. Yeah, it's the names of those who've paid you in excess of. So that there's a the, the idea here is to get at what are people's sources of income, mm -hmm. not what are all of the details of every single transaction that they've ever done? I, I, that's my interpretation. And I'm seeing a nod from director. Um, does that make sense? No, it does. It does. I mean, yeah, yeah. Just when, when everybody else is here, I just want to workshop. Right? Okay. Yeah. Right yeah. Right yeah. So I don't, I don't want to go totally, I don't want to go totally no. down the rabbit hole on this right now. That's why but, I'm backing off the throttle. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, <laughs> I think we should have everybody in the room. And make it. I know this is a big hang up yeah. for a couple of members who couldn't be that's, here right now. Yeah. So Representative Nugent, go ahead. Uh, so as we were talking about the, like, they don't have to disclose it if it's confidential. I was just wondering where that decision gets made and like, is there a definition of what confidential, what would qualify as that? Sorry. Oh, no, please go ahead, please. Sorry, I'm looking at like, is, is something designated as confidential under law? We've added a definition as to what constitutes confidential information in here. It's on uh, page six. It's uh, not highlighted because that was the last round um, of uh, edits. And defined confidential information means information that is exempt from public inspection and copying under uh, Public Records Act or otherwise designated by law as confidential. So the, the person disclosing this side. It's all self-reported anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the end, this is much like if when you file your tax return, you know, the government's asking you to self-disclose what your sources of income were, right? And here with a candidate financial disclosure, we're we as the state are saying these are the things that we expect a candidate to self-disclose. The degree to which they make a good faith effort to provide the details that they're being asked for is probably going to in large part be proportional to how specific the form is. <laughs> right. <laughs> so like, I, I'm really trying to say every time I read this disclosure section, I'm like, what is this going to look like on a form and what am I going to be expected to do? And I actually think one of the things that might be useful for us to do when, when we as a whole committee come back to the disclosures and I had thought about doing it today, but I wanted to get through this draft with Tim. Uh, is to actually look at the disclosure forms that we have now as some examples, because there's not much on them. And I actually think even with all this level of specificity and the, the conversation that we've had here, there's not going to be a whole, whole lot more on the forms. <laughs> like we're asking candidates to say, who pays you, you know, and where does your, where's your income coming from? And, and I think we've got hung up on the thresholds because they, they make a reasonable person when they look at the plain text reading of this go, oh, there's a threshold for a dollar amount there. 
that must mean I need to report a dollar amount. And really it's just about saying, I have these sources of income. Like we all report our employers now. Like I report that I work for a solar company. I don't say what my salary is or anything like that. And nothing about that is changing in this law. But, but now for self-employed people, we're getting much more specific about, you know, which, which clients they need to report or what circumstances. So I think there's room for us to debate exactly how much information we want to ask for. We'll come back to that. Good question. Okay. All right. So let's keep the next thing required to be disclosed uh, by candidates on that form is uh, membership and position on any board or commission in the prior 12 months. Then loans made to a company if the candidate owned more than 10% of a company and if the loan was not commercially reasonable and made in the ordinary course of business. And we just uh, went on to define that later on in this um, section. Uh, fifth, a companies in which the candidate had an ownership or controlling interest in the previous 12 months that had business with the state or municipality. Six, a description, but not amount, of publicly traded assets and interests in trust, um, interests in trust valued at $25,000 or more and municipal bonds issued in the state of Vermont at any value. These are to be reported to the best of the candidate's knowledge which permits a candidate to describe blind trust and similar assets like an investor. And seventh, full name of the candidate's spouse or domestic partner. Then let's see, subsection C would enable candidates to redact their U.S. individual income tax return form 1040. Uh, sorry, from that, they could redact the candidate's street address and identifying information and signature of a paid preparer. And uh, just another note, uh, that's not all legislators that would uh, be providing their 1040. It's only state officers. <clears throat> and that concludes section one. Section two, uh, in-office uh, disclosure requirements is sections uh, two through five, I should say, which begins. Da, da, da. Uh, so, on page seven, um, in this has to do with migrating certain definitions um, from other parts of the chapter into the definition section, including conflict of interest, which has stayed the same, uh, county officer, um, which has been added, and in this context is uh, Individuals holding the office of high bailiff state's attorney. And I'd just like to make a note that that is different than the candidate disclosure, which uh, requires county officers, including um, the probate and assistant judges. Um, but once they're in office, no longer being required to disclose mm -hmm. things. And then let's see. And Tim, that's yeah. the logic behind that being that they're, they're covered by the judicial branches of code. And we've got separation of powers issues with requiring the judiciary branch folks once they're elected to office, right. they have their own code of ethics. And right, under the Vermont Constitution, there's some nuance there, separation of powers issues indeed. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay, let's see. Um, in this definitions um, section, they uh, also under the definition of governmental conduct regulated by law, we include, uh, this bill includes creating or permitting to persist any unlawful employment practice pursuant to 21 of BSA section 495, and that's um, essentially uh, discrimination um, laws uh, there in, with the effect that that can now be grouped into uh, uh, what is considered uh, unethical conduct that can be examined by the commission or referred to by the commission to uh, controlling entities. Let's see. Uh, section three, um, let's see, also migrates the definition, uh, definition of public servants into the definition section without changing it. Um, and section four migrates uh, conflict of interest uh, definition without changing it into the definition section as well. Uh, let's see, section five. Um, will require the same additional information to be disclosed for in-office, executive officers and county officers, 
as candidates for those offices in section one, uh, except for that nuance having to do with different county. Um, so again, everything that we're just discussing uh, as far as section one is replicated here. So those same um, uh, conditions and uh, thresholds are repeated here in the uh, in section five, that is. So the next part of the bill has to do with delinquent disclosures for candidates for state office, county office, state center, and state representative. This is section six, and this is found at the bottom of page 15 for reference. And section six will add a new section, 17 PSA, section 2415, this election title regarding penalties uh, uh, for uh, those individuals who um, was just now who did not properly file their financial disclosures. Subsections A create the penalty structure, and that is the Secretary of State will notify the State Ethics Commission, which will issue a notice of delinquency to the candidates in HL five working days from the date of the issuance of the notice to cure the delinquency, after which the candidate will pay $10 a day, uh, accumulating at maximum up to $1,000. Then section E makes the and water's in. Sorry, yes. I don't know. This is a question. Um for you, for you, but is there does the Secretary of State's office already go through all of those uh, filings after the date and let people know if they have missed the filing date? I know that they collect, I'm not sure if oh sorry. So you're asking under current law? Or yeah, under what what, what's it? currently happening? Are they already analyzing, or not even analyzing, but are they already collecting or just, it's just a, you put it in there and walk away? Okay. Yeah, so the, the, I think we've heard in testimony actually, but I know this for a fact that the Secretary of State does not enforce the requirements. Right, but they don't even look. I was wondering if they just kind of page through and say, Hey, Rep. Waters Evans, you're a day late. Or no, for instance, it's I think if you've ever been, especially like in between cycles when you're not raising money and yeah. it's, you know, we're serving and busy and whatever, like I myself oh. missed a campaign finance filing deadline during the session when I'm not raising money and there's no activity, right? right? Yeah. And there is absolutely nothing right now where you don't get a notification. You don't get, I mean, it is, it is literally just uh, yeah. only the only real accountability right now a constituent or a reporter or someone looks and says, ha, ah, I see the candidate so-or-so or official so-and-so has not filed their disclosures. So there, there really isn't any mechanism right now. Uh, it's just there for... It, the, the, only, the only incentive that you have to do it really right now is that you would um, sort of you could get shamed for not doing it <laughs> right yeah it's just it's really like just the public transparency and the potential that someone would call you out for not filing is really the only thing now to, to encourage you there isn't even kind of a, a consultative mechanism that reminds you that you're supposed to do yeah. right now so we're trying to at least take a big step in the direction of creating a culture where it's expected that everybody does it and that there will be some level of accountability uh, represented by our Thank you. Uh, so, so still in subsection three. Uh, um, so the $10 penalty and the $1,000 threshold, I guess I have two questions. Um, is this made public while the penalty is accruing? Uh, presumably it is a public record. So do the public record set. Okay, but it's not like, it's not like advertised, I guess. Like if somebody falls into this, there's no, uh, this would not require uh, either the Secretary of State or the State Commission to post the yeah. uh, public wall of, yeah. Yes, well, well, like that. So my next, start my next question is, um, it says that the, any penalty imposed under this uh, division exceed $1,000. So if you hit the $1,000 mark, it just plateaus there yes. and it doesn't, yeah, so it just, I'm just thinking if like, that's actually enough of a deterrent that somebody's doing nefarious, is a thousand dollars just a possibility to not disclose? Well, that's more of a theoretical, ethical conversation. That's extra shameless. 
Yeah, I think the story about somebody just being like, I'm paying $1,000 to talk to <laughs> you. That would be... Like, uh, I'm, I'm like printing over here being sketchy. <laughs> that, that, would raise the, that would raise the bar pretty high. I don't, I don't know that that's been contemplated. Yeah. Um, In my mind, it's like a sketchy hedge fund matrix, right? <laughs> like, you make an $85 million trade, it's a $2 million penalty. Cut that yeah. check all day. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I just want to point out that we can able to use the Debt Set Out Collection Act, which means we can uh, collect the fine from any tax we on this too. <laughs> so I, I think what Representative Byron is getting at, though, is the thing of like, you know, people who, uh, you know, if, if the fine for, you know, doing some sort of illegal trade, Unethical, nefarious. Uh, yeah, you want to bend that one. It, yeah. it is way less than the profit you're making off of that financial transaction. Uh, there's not really much of a disincentive there. I think the, the bigger thing here is we're talking about people who are expected to maintain the public's trust. Mm -hmm. And right now, it's just so easy to just kind of go, ah, you know, I forget. It's no big deal. This makes it a notch heavier, but I don't think it completely solves the problem. Um, and I think we all know that people who don't have the highest level of integrity have been elected to public office. So that's uh, that's an issue uh, sort of across the board. <laughs> Representative Chase, go ahead. Okay. Would that fine be per person or per election cycle or per filing deadline? Or what's the $1,000 cap? Sure. Constraining. It's um, as currently drafted. It's let's see. In no event shall any amount of any penalty imposed under the subdivision exceed one thousand dollars. So it's framed as uh, under the subdivision, which would be. Let's see. First back to that. I would think that it might be limited overall across so numerous mm -hmm. elections. Okay. Um, that could be clarified. I don't know if it's necessarily limited to per cycle. I think I'm hearing per person. Like, if you hit that thousand dollar cap in your first election cycle, then it's got free for the next eight seven years. Like, valid observation. Yeah, greater clarity. I mean, perhaps that I. Have it state per per cycle. I mean, do we want to have a conversation about tightening that up to like per election cycle, per filing period? Like, I don't know. Like, how do we want to untwangle this twine? No, I think people need to file every time, and it should be tied to the <laughs> it should be tied to the filing. And if they're just letting it go, it can go in multiple filings because they have the opportunity yeah. in this draft to go to the ethics commission and say, I, you know. To, to plead ignorance or find, or technical difficulty. And I don't think it's the ethics commission's desire to be trying to get a fine. The idea is to get the disclosure to be a real thing and have people take it seriously, right? No, but I mean, I'm just a little brain stuck in the, in the fact that if this is, if, if the thousand just goes into infinity, like it, where's the where's the break point where you, you could theoretically be fined and penalized again if the action continues? I think the fine is less important. I think the fact of the fine is less important than the amount. So it's to me, it doesn't. That's a moot point. But we can talk about it if you want to flag that and come back to it. Like, here's what I'm going to say. If anybody has a suggestion about language, I'd rather not have a okay. hypothetical abstract debate about any of this so that we can get through it and yeah. just make a suggestion. Representative Cooper. Um, just a language question. Um, you just said, and it's written, that it can be waived or reduced. Um, but there's a shall up there. Yes. Uh, uh, Section three. Add mm -hmm. uh, negate one. Um, we can clarify that with a notwithstanding. Okay. Or, yeah. Sixteen, page sixteen. Shall we? So 
Tim, you're saying add the notwithstanding to line 19 so that it's yes. clear that notwithstanding the previous the state of ethics mission has about it. Okay, I understand. It's implied here, just that's a good point, Representative Hooper. Excellent. Let's see. So, um, um, okay. And subsection E makes any intentionally fraudulent statements on disclosure forms a quote false claim and quote pursuant to 13 BSA section 3016, which shall be referred to the Attorney General and State's Attorney for Enforcement. Next part of the bill, part four. This is section seven through 14 has to do with the expansion of the State Ethics Commission's powers. And the following sections will expand upon uh, the commission's powers or expand the commission's powers, enabling it to investigate, hold hearings and make non-binding recommendations as well as enter into resolution agreements. So section seven, and now we turn to page 18. Um, that highlight on there is, uh, uh, let's see, uh, enables the, uh, this is kind of a, a correction of something that's already implied, just making it uh, explicit that the State Ethics Commission can accept, review, investigate um, matters involving uh, the actual state code of ethics itself, which doesn't hurt to spell it out there, <laughs> but I know it's implied, uh, as well as refer um, uh, matters uh, to uh, entities that can actually discipline uh, individuals. So we have, okay. So section seven amends um, uh, section uh, three, or three VSA section 1221, State Ethics Commission, uh, subsection A, to empower the State Ethics Commission to independently investigate and hold hearings regarding ethics complaints. This is some of the general enabling uh, language at the beginning of the chapter. Um, and also like to say that uh, section 1221 is also amended by section uh, 11 later on, which will add another member uh, to the commission and by section 12, which removes the requirement that the commission executive director be part-time. And again, this is amended in three different sections just to kind of uh, keep all the amendments uh, thematically organized uh, versus um, uh, if the commission or the committee would like it otherwise, we can easily change that. Just uh, if anybody notices, we keep returning to some of the same uh, sections, that's why. Uh, section eight just simply renames uh, three VSA 1222, to be more uh, factually uh, accurate and descriptive. Uh, section nine, uh, we already uh, discussed this earlier, but again, it will rename a three VSA section 1223 to be called procedures for accepting and referring complaints. And this uh, will require a consultation with any entity receiving a referred complaint to check in with the commission and to make sure that uh, they understand the state code of ethics and how the facts presented in the complaint may uh, uh, relate to it. Section 10 will add the new section, uh, 3 VSA, section 1227, having to do with investigations. And sound familiar, stay this earlier, but just reiterate it, reiterate it here, enables the commission to investigate alleged unethical conduct occurring within the prior two years with or without receiving a complaint. And here we have, we updated in this version um, so that investigations must conclude within six months versus three months. And so I'll just um, over to that. And you can see that at the bottom of page 20 here in uh, subsection G, timeline of investigation. As well as uh, next line, burner proof. Uh, we have uh, changed a probable cause to a uh, reasonable basis to believe that the uh, public service conduct constitutes an unethical violation. Um, substantively the same, just uh, for you to be a little bit more reader friendly. The, let's see. So I'll place here for a moment. Uh, and then we uh, you know, put the bills altered uh, so that only by a majority of members present may an investigation or a subsequent hearing be initiated. Section 11. So Tim, can I just make sure that, that I understand the changes we made here? So um, 
ethics commission gets complete, if the executive director uh, executive director shall only initiate an investigation if the majority of the members of the commission present affirmative present affirmatively vote to proceed. So there has to be a an affirmative vote in order for an investigation to proceed. Yeah, I think this will be discussed last yeah. time. So I know TJ weighed in um, with some reasons why it might be better just to have the executive director make the decision. I did discuss with the commission. They like the idea of the commission vote. So. Especially early on. I mean, with the investigative power being new, I like that there's more consultation with the commission before launching an investigation. And then the timeline is six months, the burden of proof. So to go from an investigation to a hearing is not a reasonable basis to believe that there's been uh, unethical conduct, a violation of the code. And so when, what's the definition of reasonable basis, Tim? Like what level of, what does that really mean in legal parlance? Not arbitrary and capricious. So, um, uh, would a reasonable person look at this and uh, come to a similar uh, conclusion that there may, um, that the public servant's conduct constitutes an unethical violation? A reasonable person look at the code and look at the conduct and be like, there may be something there. Not necessarily definitive or proved by any means, but um, just that it's reasonable to that, that may have occurred. Right. So it's just a, it's a standard that we're using as a gate for the proceeding from an investigation to a hearing. Okay. And then the new section that I think is where you just stop is next. So this is the determination after investigation. So this, uh, if a majority of the members of the commission <laughs> Firmly vote in concurrence with the executive director's determination that an evidentiary hearing is warranted. The executive director shall prepare an investigation report specifying public servants' alleged unethical conduct. And so this is really getting at the hearing and what will happen there. Okay. Right. So to progress from the investigation to an evidentiary hearing, there's a vote that uh, needs to occur at which point an investigation report will uh, become public. And uh, a copy of that will be uh, served upon the public servants and any individual, assuming there is any, uh, that uh, submitted a complaint. And then also that would be bundled with uh, the notice of hearing uh, pursuant to uh, conditions set out in another section. The, okay, then questions there. Uh, section 11 will add a new section, 3 BSA 1228, hearings before the commission. And this is uh, bottom of page 21, the bill going uh, over to page 22. Uh, this enables the commission to hold public hearings for the purpose of gathering evidence and testimony and making determinations if wanted. Uh, both the public servant and any complainant will be afforded an opportunity to be heard at the hearing, present evidence, respond to evidence, and argue on all issues related to the alleged unethical misconduct. And here the highlights, um, I've just gone in and corrected, uh, just clarified, there were references to the parties, but in order, considering this bill, uh, uh, pertains to both some elections title stuff and uh, ethics commission, uh, figured it'd be best to avoid any ambiguity and just rename the parties as uh, public servants and complaints, because that's who we're really referring to. Here. Section 12 has a new section 3 VSA 12, 9, uh, 1229, now to be titled Warnings, Reprimands, Recommended Actions, and Agreements. This enables the Commission to issue warnings, reprimands, and recommended actions within 30 days of the last hearing. The recommendations may include uh, facilitated mediation, um, additional training and education. Referrals to counseling and wellness support and other remedial actions. And again, like any other time we use, including um, doesn't necessarily limit it to what we give as provide as examples. 
the new language here uh, in draft 3.2 has to do with the uh, commission being able to enter into resolution agreements with the public servant. And they can do this at any point in time before or during the proceedings. Uh, if it's during the proceedings, it would put a pause on any uh, pending deadlines. And then the director would be required to uh, check in at three months to see that um, the agreement is actually being complied with. Otherwise, um, uh, proceedings would resume. And this is uh, on page 26, where we see the, uh, the entire page highlighted there. And there's some additional uh, information on what a resolution agreement shall include. Um, actually, would you like me to take some time to walk through that, uh, Chair McCarthy? Or yeah, so I think actually what would be helpful is on the resolution agreements, we probably when we have executive director Sivrek come up, we'll talk about what they are and sort of how they would they would function. Um, I don't, I don't know if just delving into the language will illuminate <laughs> how it'll work enough for us to really get our heads around it. Okay. That makes sense. We can probably breeze over that for now and we'll ask Director Silver and TJ to give us a little bit more context and examples of how it might work. Okay. Uh, section 13, uh, we'll add a new section three VSA 2030 uh, procedure and rulemaking. And this directs the commission to adopt rules regarding procedural and evidentiary aspects of the commission's investigations and hearings. Uh, the language has been so modified since the last draft so that two thirds of the commission's members present in voting may waive an application of a rule. It also grants the commission, as well as the executive director and the commission's legal counsel and investigators, power to issue subpoenas and administer oaths in connection with any investigation or hearing. And again, the updates here have just uh, uh, made clear that the commission, as well as its staffers, um, certain staffers may uh, issue subpoenas. Section 14 adds a new section, 3 BSA, section 1231, records and confidentiality, and public records relating to the commission's handling of complaints, alleged <clears throat> unethical conduct, investigations, and proceedings are presumably exempt from public records, the Public Records Act, and shall be kept confidential, except, and then we uh, enumerate a list here of things that would be presumably public and not confidential. And those would include investigation re uh, reports if a hearing is found to be warranted, two, investigation reports relating to alleged unethical conduct um, and determined <clears throat> conduct determined to not warrant a hearing if requested by the public servant. Three, evidence produced in the open and public portions of the commission hearings or any warnings, reprimands, recommendations issued by the commission. Five, any resolution agreements. Six, any records as determined by the commission that support a warning, reprimand, recommendation, or executed resolution agreement. And at the, that concludes uh, the expansion of the powers. I just have a note in the summary uh, to remind the committee that, uh, as I've said before, there's no appeals process namely because there's no binding final decision. There's no expulsion from office, no fine, no loss of property, right, et cetera. Um, that is, there's nothing to appeal. The next part of the bill has to do with the State Ethics Commission membership. This is section 15. This amends 3 VSA section 1221, um, a second time that is, to expand its membership from five to six members to include an additional one member appointed um, by the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Part six has to do with State Ethics Commission staffing. This is sections 16 and 17, so we're now on page 30 of the bill. And together, section 16 and 17 uh, convert the commission's uh, positions of executive director and administrative assistant from part-time to full-time and adds a full-time attorney. Section 12 removes the requirement um, that the commission's executive director be part-time. Sorry, that should be 16, 17. I'll update the summary to reflect the typo. So section 16 removes the requirement that the commission's executive director be part-time and section 17 reclassifies those positions and appropriates funds for each. And currently, right now, these are um, uh, estimates of placeholders. Uh, 
$150,000 for legal counsel, $150,000 for the executive director, and $57,000 administrative assistant. Part seven of the bill has to do with a small citation correction. That's section 18. And that just um, amends a cross-reference um, that uh, right now it's currently cross-referencing to nothing. And so we figured we'd just update that. Um, or a statute that doesn't really, isn't there. Uh, part eight of the bill has to do with ethics data collection. This is section 19. And this renames three PSA. 1226 to be called the ethics data collection semicolon commission's report and it requires those entities to which the commission refers complaints to report back annually quote with aggregate data on ethics complaints not submitted to the commission with the complaints separated by topic and the disposition of those complaints including any prosecution enforcement action or dismissal those reporting entities that uh Let's see, <clears throat> those reporting entities that it's referring to are the Office of the Attorney General, the State's Attorney's Office, the Department of Human Resources, the House and Senate Ethics Panels, the Judicial Conduct Board, the Professional Responsibility Board, and the Office of State uh, Court Administrator. That brings us to the last part of the bill, this uh, kind of confusing run-on sentence that's highlighted in section 12 on the last page of 34. And those are the, um, the three rollout periods the various sections. Um, here, would you like me to reiterate those? No, I already covered them, but we have to read them again. No, that's fine. It's okay. All right. Great. So thank you very much, Tim, for getting us all the way through this draft. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, invite Director Sibrit up um, I had, I had a few questions and just kind of wanted to see what our uh, way to zero in on resolving a few of these uh, outstanding issues. And I was hoping we might just touch on a couple of the disclosure pieces since Representative Lee's here now. I don't want to spend the bulk of our time on that. What I'd like to do is kind of get to um, talking both about how the investigatory timelines would, would go and see if the committee has any questions or concerns about that, um, and also get a little bit of a primer on resolution agreements and how those might work in practice. Does that sound like a reasonable agenda for you. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so just uh, to bring Representative Higley up to speed. So we, in this draft, um, didn't make any big changes because I, I wanted to kind of have this be more of a, a discussion at the committee level. Um, so the, the one piece that I think we had left unresolved in this draft is at the top of page, bottom of page two, top of page three, um, around the disclosure of um, clients for self-employed um, candidates for office. And um, Director Sivert, after hearing some of our discussion about this, um, where where do you recommend we kind of strike the balance between wanting to know where a candidate's income comes from, um, but not necessarily needing to know the name of every single client that you know, for instance, a contractor works for, um, if they can say, you know, I have my self-employed construction or renovation business or something like that, is what what we really want them to list. Yeah, my suggestion would be, so, and this is in the spirit of like getting at what we really want to get at, is you could narrow it down a bit further. And I think this would probably provide a bit of clarity. So you're looking at the names, maybe so many clients known to have business before, you know, a government office, but you can narrow it down to um, the client being regulated by the state in their business or having a contract with the state. So that would narrow it down further and I think still get at what we're really trying to get at here. Yeah, I think the, so the, so we would essentially strike Ruminant to the names of clients that are paying above a certain threshold. And so it's really, they're just listing their source of income 
and then listing any clients that are known to them to have business before the state. But we would strike the need for them to list any clients that just happen to have contracted with them for more than a certain amount at this point. Would that satisfy your concern if we strike the piece that is Romanet to there representatively? Yeah. yeah, I think it would. Okay. So Tim, I think that that's where we're going to head in the next drafts. Okay. Unless anybody has any objection from the committee, representative. Sure. You said regulated by the state. Mm -hmm. So if they're in a business that's regulated by the state, so really getting at situations where some maybe somebody is regularly applying. Sorry. Are they being his client or are they being the client? Okay. Yeah. So say somebody's in a business where they're regularly applying for permits. So they have they're right, they're in a business or that is regulated by the state. So we know that they definitely have business before the state. So we're not looking at situations where um, where they are purely coming before the state for administrative reasons. Say they are, um, you know, I think it's a good one. They work for a newspaper and then you know they're going to get their driver's license, right? So we're not looking at those types of situations. We're looking at somebody where their their own business is regulated by the state or they have a contract with the state. So in this particular specific case, being regulated by the state wouldn't necessarily mean. Social comes in and looks at me. Social comes in and looks at you. No, I mean, we're not looking for like a really expansive definition of regulated by the state because, in that sense, you, you could say, you know, anyone who applies for any sort of license is regulated by the state. Yeah. Oh, you're, sorry. No, no, no. I'm just like, I, my interest speaks with this just because I'm, I just thought, like, you know, like the entire OPR bill could fall in. Right. Like, anyway, no, but so, I'm, I understand the intent. I'm just trying to make the words on the page match the intent, so we don't do this downstream with the buildings. <laughs> I'd rather do this now. Okay. What I would strongly suggest is, if you have recommendations for language, get them to Tim and CC Representative Waters, Evans, and myself before the end of this week. That is what I would strongly recommend, and so that we're not wordsmithing here in real time. I mean, maybe TJ, do you have any thoughts on what might be clarifying language so that we're not getting too broad of a definition of regulated by the state? Um, my thoughts are that you could say, um, make clear that it's in a professional realm, um, not regulated by the state for something uh, that that is other than what they're making money for. I mean, it's possible to, you know, you, you raise the issue of uh, driver's licenses even if you need a driver's license to conduct your business, that wouldn't be regulated by the state. It would have to do with the profession itself. Um, you know, responsible dumping of uh, toxic liquids you know, comes to mind as something that you would want. Um, the profession itself is regulated by the state and uh, people would have to be certified to do that. That would be emblematic of the type of profession that you would, you would want to disclose or the client would want to disclose. Yeah. I think the the archetypical example here of the information we're trying to capture is, you know, the independent attorney who represents clients who have business before the state. Yeah, public utility commission, permits for major projects, you know, a real estate developer who's, you know, working on things that are regulated by ANR. What we're not trying to capture is somebody who's a dentist and happens to perform certain procedures because they have a license to be a dentist. We don't really, I don't think there's gonna be any argument <laughs> that they have a particular financial interest <laughs> that needs to be disclosed to the public about their client. So trying to make sure that we're making that distinction, I think is, is where the represent buyer. Yeah, I, I just wanted to be clear so there's no ambiguity downstream and this gets gummed up later. I'd rather hash this out now. 100%. Because we've had our heads in it for the most significant. We're gonna try and get there by next, the next draft is gonna be like, just ready for the, the final the final polish, I think. And that's why we're doing this. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so Tim, do you think that you might be able to help us capture the distinction there in the next draft? Okay, I think I think our legislative council's got it. Uh, all right, I think we can move on from there. Anyway. <laughs> um, and I think that, um, and this is mostly for Representative Higley's benefit, I think that with the thresholds and the making it clear that the um, a description of but not the amount of individual holdings is what we're looking for in the form, I think that'll resolve 
99% of the concerns that I've heard from folks who, you know, don't necessarily, especially for the spouse of a member of the General Assembly, that's the most common thing that's been brought up to me is that folks are really concerned that they might have to disclose the amount of a particular holding that they have. And I think what we're looking for here is just the knowledge that the client or their partner spouse has an interest in a particular company, for instance, as opposed to the amount of that. And we've made that really clear in this, in the last couple of drafts, but I just wanted to flag that because I know it's been a point of some anxiety, especially for members who are worried about their their spouse or their domestic partner saying, you can't run for office anymore if I have to say how much Apple stock I have or whatever. Uh, Representative Waters, did you have something there? I just had a comment, which is that, is it correct to say that no point in that one place in this bill are we asking for actual amounts of money that are to be disclosed by anyone regarding any, correct? That's really helpful. In excess of <laughs> Right, like not anyone is, is right, but it's not an amount of money. Correct, right? yeah, you're just- For anybody, at any point, not their spouse, not their client, not their salary, it's just over a certain amount at some point. Okay, just wanted to clarify. Do you have any remaining questions about disclosure before we move on? I don't think so at this point. Okay, great. I mean, we'll be we'll be back at it with a, a revised draft eventually here, but okay, thanks. Um, okay, I think we can move on to talking about some of the the meteor stuff here. Um, and I'm wondering maybe uh, trying to get down to. So starting maybe with section nine, Director Sivrey, I just wanted to sort of really root the committee in from the time that you as the executive director or the attorney, you know, starts working on a complaint, receives a complaint, what are the kind of powers and how are they changing here as The first thing here is that uh, the, the requirement for an agency that the Ethics Commission refers a, a complaint to is sort of the first thing that's changing. Right, that is the first thing that's changing. So currently we have no power to decide whether we would you know, investigate our complaints. So we would only review the complaint for sufficiency to make sure it alleges facts um, that you know, suggest that a violation of the Code of Ethics may or may not have happened, may have happened. Depending on you know further investigation, sometimes of course uh, you can tell from the face of the complaint uh, that it's likely that it has. And so, what's changing here for us is that we have the power to investigate a complaint rather than refer it on. Um, and those complaints that we do refer on, which is honestly going to be the majority of them, because I you know at least to begin with, we'll have very limited resources and very limited ability to follow up investigations. It require um, consultation uh, on the part of the referring agency, the, the agency they refer the complaint to, related specifically to the code of ethics and the facts alleged in them. And I do have a couple of suggestions here. I think we were still a bit, you know, thinking through the process, what it would look like here. I do think it's important that we add some clarification um, that there's that this should be done within a certain within a certain one second. Yeah, so I think what we're going to do is just stop the live stream and then restart so that we make sure that we're following all the rules for the streaming. Recording stopped. Uh, for, <laughs> all right, so we just had a little uh, technical glitch there, so we're picking back our uh, testimony on our miscellaneous ethics bill. Thank you, Executive Director Sivrit, for your patience there. No problem. I just wanted to uh, bring up the consultation process, which would be, you know, one of the newer things that we're doing, I do think it's important. I think it's important, I mentioned last time, because it's another level of transparency. It ensures that the code of ethics is uh, being applied consistently um, throughout government. And also um, it you know, encourages collaboration. I, we're still thinking exactly how the process would work, but we do think there are three elements that would be important to include. One is to set a certain time frame during which the consultation has to occur, that the consultation should be in writing, and that um, consultation occurs prior to a major decision being made about the complaint, which would, would be either you know a decision to complain the 
to close the complaint without further investigation or before findings were issued are issued. So could you repeat that third one? Sorry. Um, before um, a decision is made to close the complaint without um, moving forward with investigation or before findings are issued, so after the investigation. Okay. Um, so mm -hmm. moving forward, the power to investigate. So the commission through the executive director may investigate public servants for alleged unethical conduct. The commission may investigate either without receiving a complaint or after being referred to the commission. Um, so that would be the newest power and that would give us the ability to investigate complaints that I think the criteria that would be using it at first, because it is such a, a kind of limited ability to move forward with investigations. We have had a number of complaints in the past where there was no place to refer those complaints to. Um, and so in those situations, they just kind of, we have to close them out because there is no, there's no place to refer them. And so that would be one of the criteria I think we'd be looking at. We'd also be looking at does the complaint allege, um, firmly allege complaints that fall under the code of violations that fall under the code of ethics versus other rules, laws, or policies. Um, sometimes we get complaints that nominally fall under the, the state code of ethics, um, but aren't really an ethics complaint. Those would continue to be referred on, I think, you know, regardless of the, of the circumstances. Um, and then, of course, looking at, you know, complaints that may require like a specific level of impartiality where we just feel like the Ethics Commission is best uh, best positioned to investigate this, the nature of this complaint given the parties, given the, the substance of the complaint. Um, so the initiate, initiation of investigation by the commission. So this would be new in the sense that we would have the ability to investigate a complaint or take on a complaint without it being uh, submitted to us by a third party. And so I think those would also be reserved for pretty rare situations. Um, Please let me know if you have any questions about that. I'm not sure where I'm not sure where I should get more information or just keep moving through. Or... Uh, I think I think this it's up to the committee to ask. This is our kind of you know we're slowly absorbing all of the information about how this would kind of work because it's new power. So go ahead, Representative Waters. Thanks. So would an example of of that last um, situation you mentioned be? If somebody saw a newspaper article that was about something that was happening, you know, in a town or department or agency or whatever, and then decided that it was worth looking into independently without receiving a complaint, would that be? Okay. I think that would be a good example. Okay. Yes. So statute of limitations, uh, two year statute of limitations, as I legal counsel and investigators, so executive director may appoint legal counsel, counsel uh, to assist with investigations, hearings, or the issuance of warnings. Uh, notice the executive director shall notify the complainant and public servant in writing of any complaint being investigated. Complaint participation, the complainant shall have the right to be heard in investigation resulting from the complaint. Uh, timeline investigation, investigation shall conclude within six months, either the date the complaint was received or in the event no complaint was received, the date of the investigation's initiation by the executive director. Burden of proof, uh, I think we went over the reasonable basis standard. So the reasonable basis standard would be applied um, before subsequent to investigation and before a hearing process. Determination after the investigation, upon investigating the alleged unethical conduct, if the executive director determines that an evidentiary hearing is warranted, the executive director shall notify the commission if a majority of the members of the commission present affirmatively vote in concurrence with the executive director's determination that an evidentiary hearing is warranted, the executive director shall prepare an investigation report specifying the public servant's alleged unethical conduct, a copy of which shall be served upon the public servant and any complainant together with a notice of hearing. Upon investigating the alleged unethical conduct, if the executive director determines that an evidentiary, evidentiary hearing is not warranted, the executive director shall notify the commission, the public servant, and any complainant in writing of the results of the investigation and the termination of proceedings. So I'll say that um, based on my experience, as far as receiving complaints, um, I think this does solve some issues um, or concerns, concerns that people have when complaints are referred by our office. Often the complainant doesn't hear what the result is. And so that's very frustrating to people. And so I do think that that's, um, you know, quite the advancement and it's uh, contributing to public trust in the system that they will now have the opportunity to you know what exactly happened and have more information about what happened to their complaint. Because we do have situations where we'll forward a complaint and a month later with all that from the complainant and they've never heard back from the referral agency to even, you know, reach out to them at all. Thank you. 
maybe this is for Tim right quick. Um, the notifying writing, does that include electronic means these days? Uh, or does it have to be like? No, it doesn't have to be postmarked. Okay. Email. Thank you. There is all hearings. The commission may meet and hold hearings for the purpose of gathering evidence and testimony if found warranted pursuant to section 1227 of this title and to make determinations. All commission hearings shall be considered meetings of the commission as described in 1221E and shall be conducted in accordance with uh, 1BSA section 310. Time of hearing, chair of the commission shall so, so set a time for the hearing as soon as convenient following the director's determination that an evidentiary hearing is warranted subject to the discovery of very needs of the public servant any complainant is established in any mm -hmm. hearing or discovery conference or in any orders regulating discovery and depositions are both but not later than 30 days after service the charge upon the public servant the public servant or complainant may file motions to extend the time of the hearing for good cause which may be granted by the chair notice of hearing the chair shall give the public servant and any complainant reasonable notice of a hearing which will include a statement of the time place and nature of the hearing a statement of the legal authority and jurisdiction under which the hearing is being held, a reference to the particular sections of the statute and rules involved, a short and plain statement of the matters at issue, if the commission is unable to state the matters in detail at the time of the <laughs> initial notice be limited to a statement of the issues involved, thereafter upon application by either the public servant or any complainant, a more definite and detailed statement may be furnished, shall be furnished. A reference and a copy of any rules adopted by the commission regarding the hearings procedure rules of evidence and other aspects of the hearing so that's uh, one of the things that we're working on between now and the effective date of the bill should it go through rights of public servants and complainants opportunity shall be given to the public servant and the complainant to be heard at the hearing present, present evidence respond to evidence and argue on all issues related to the alleged unethical misconduct executive session in addition to the provisions of 1 bsa section 13 313a Commission may enter executive session if the commission deems it appropriate in order to protect the confidentiality of any individual or any other protected information pertaining to any identifiable person that is otherwise confidential under state or federal law. And I think that um, fairly well tracks how we handle advisory opinions at this point. So we need to talk to your parties who are requesting an advisory opinion. Uh, section 1229 warnings, reprimands, recommended actions, agreements. Power to issue warnings, reprimands, and recommended actions. The commission may issue warnings, reprimands, and recommended actions not inconsistent with the law, constitution and laws of the state, including facilitating mediation, additional training and education, referrals to counseling, and wellness support or other remedial actions. Factors and determination, circumstances of unethical conduct in this term. In this determining, the commission shall consider the degree of unethical conduct, the timeline over which the unethical conduct occurred, whether the conduct was repeated and the privacy rights and responsibilities of the parties. Determination based on evidence, the commission shall render its determination on the allegation on the basis of the evidence and the record before it, regardless of whether the commission makes its determination on the investigative report of the executive director pursuant to section 1227 of this title alone on evidence and testimony presented in the hearing pursuant to section 1228 or on its own findings. Burden of proof. The commission shall only issue a warning, reprimand, or recommend the action if it finds that by a preponderance of the evidence, public servant committed an unethical act. Determination after hearing, if a majority of the members of the commission present, present in voting, find that the public servant committed unethical conduct as specified in the investigation report, the executive director, pursuant to section 1227 of its title alone, the commission shall then in writing or stated in the record, issue a warning, recommend, or recommended action. If the commission does not find that the public servant committed unethical conduct, the commission shall issue a statement that the allegations were not proved. When a determination or order is approved for issue by a board or commission, the decision or order may be signed on behalf of, by the chair on behalf of the issuing board or commission. Timeline for determination, the commission shall make its determination within 30 days of concluding the commission's last hearing under this section. Already shall be notified forthwith, either personally or by mail, of the commission's determination and of any warning, reprimand, or recommended action. Referral of unethical conduct, notwithstanding subsection 1223 of this title, the commission shall notify the attorney general or the state's attorney of jurisdiction of any alleged violations of governmental conduct regulated by law or the relevant federal agency of any alleged violations of federal law if discovered in the course of the commission's investigations. I think was this was the section people were most interested in. 
power to enter into resolution agreements, notwithstanding any provision of this chapter. To the contrary, the commission may, by a majority of its vote, of its members present, enter in a resolution agreement with a public servant. A resolution agreement shall include an agreed course of remedial action be taken by the public servant, be in writing, executed by the public servant and the executive director, be a public record subject to the public inspection, cop subject to public inspection and copying under the public record contract. A resolution agreement may, may be entered into at any point in time before the commission proceedings. Any procedural deadlines described in this chapter or rules adopted pursuant to this chapter shall be paused at the time of execution on the resolution agreement. The executive director shall verify compliance with the resolution agreement within three months following execution of the agreement. And if the executive director is not satisfied that compliance has been achieved, the commission may resume its initial proceedings. Is that something where I should pause for questions or? So I think, so I think just, I wanna step, step out for the committee and um, just for a second and try to frame this a little a little bit because um i think what i'm reading in terms of the procedure and what's outlined here seems to make sense on its face but i want to kind of as we're considering this and looking it over stay rooted in what is the virtue of the investigatory and hearing power so right now the Ethics Commission's powers to provide any level of accountability for violations of the code are somewhat limited, right? They can, you all can refer to the Department of Human Resources or the Senator of the House Ethics Panels, but this would actually allow you to investigate, hold hearings, and issue essentially a public finding. Um, and I think. Tim did a good job of saying, you know, this this is a document that isn't appealable because it doesn't actually have a force and effect, but it would have a pretty big public force and effect in a lot of situations that I think we can imagine here. So could you and TJ maybe just kind of bring us back up to a high level about kind of the virtue of having ethics commissions have this sort of power, just so that we're all kind of operating from a sort of level set of values and expectations for the commission? Yeah, well, I think just from a you know, starting basis, um, you know, the best practice, the goal that we should all be trying to achieve is an independent investigatory body. Um, so the states that have the best practices in ethics, every single one of them is gonna have an independent authority that's there to investigate ethics complaints and also some measure of public, um, some measure of accountability that involves, you know, bringing public into bringing public awareness to the issues that are happening. And so right now, Vermont is just really missing that, you know, almost completely. And so even when I just look around from a high view, from, you know, somewhat of a distance, but also like having more of a close-up view than the average member of the public, it is even hard for me to kind of understand the process when ethics complaints are received by us and referred on to know exactly what happens with those complaints afterwards, much less know the timeline <laughs> during, you know, during which things are supposed to happen. Um, what are the procedures? How involved is the complainant? Um, is there findings? Are there not findings? What happens when those findings are made? What level of information is disclosed to the public? So I think that right now we're in a situation where there's varying levels of transparency across government, and we need to start setting a standard. Um, we need to start setting a standard where there is, you know, independent, independent investigation, independent, you know, eyes on ethics, generally speaking, but also setting standards that hopefully, you know, every area of government that investigates ethics complaints on its own is also starting to follow. I can't find it again, but I, I remember you uh, reading a, a section in here in regards to being able to hire outside counsel. And I'm wondering why that is when, you know, it looks like we're hiring at one hundred fifty thousand dollars legal counsel for the ethics commission. So, what what is that in regards to? I think there's two things going on there. So one is that the I think the hiring outside counsel isn't solely tied to the investigatory powers because that was envisioned initially when we we're in the, when we were considering the municipal ethics bill. So that will greatly increase the level the amount of work that the ethics commission is, is coming on. So we had initially envisioned that position as being someone who would kind of specialize in municipal ethics and also training 
So in terms of the ethics commission white staff right now, we have two part-time employees. And so we're already understaffed. So we do have slow periods during the year. We do have busier times during the year from December to May. It's the busy time. I work way more than part-time. Um, we could basically, you know, if we hired, if we had three full-time staff members right now, we could create the amount of work that <laughs> without even moving forward, just create enough work to make us all busy 40 hours a week without even getting into these new responsibilities. So I, and also we're looking at situations where, Potentially, that person has, you know, a high workload, but also we're looking at situations where there might be, you know, a conflict of interest or a reason why um, they would be the, the most appropriate person to investigate the complaint. So that gives us the flexibility uh, to hire somebody from the outside when it seems like it's the most appropriate, especially if we need somebody maybe with more specialized knowledge. And I think we're also looking at situations where we're, we would be um, potentially hiring mediators, but definitely investigators. So it'd be a wide variety of tasks that that person could take on. And because it's allocated to us now, we don't know the level of work that we're going to be getting in. So if we look at two years ago, we had three complaints come into our office. Last year, we had 15 complaints to come into our office. This month, this last month, we've already, I think, had four. And so we're really kind of moving forward at a faster pace. So we just don't know how to anticipate the workload, but I think we can expect, expect it to increase both with the municipal ethics work but also with these increased you know, powers for the Ethics Commission in terms of investigations and in terms of the ability to refer complaints and then requiring consultation. So that would be something where we would take very seriously. It would be an advisory opinion, but it'd be something that we would expect to provide an opinion in writing, which can be time consuming depending on the nature of the complaint. So um, again, uh, is, is this gonna be included in like a budgetary item as to the expectations of how much you might have to hire outside counsel? Well, my understanding, so I think it was $57,000 to be allocated in the draft bill. And so what I would anticipate is we didn't, we didn't request a specific amount, but we know we need something. And so we would use that um, during this first year we could come up to it and go past it, or we could use it less. And I think it's just really going to be, we're not going to be, you know, set, we must spend this amount over this year. So we're just going to see what is the nature of the work that's coming to us. Um, how much do we need to use external hires, uh, external contractors? So, I mean, I would say that right now we have two part-time people, TJ essentially functions as a third member of our office. And so like, even with, you know, these three, we'll call three part-time people, we are already, you know, like overworked, <laughs> um, so we so we know that we need additional additional staffing no matter what, and so the staffing that's provided that we for in this bill was anticipating municipal ethics, but not necessarily the investigations piece. So I do think that we will end up needing that money at some point to hire somebody from the outside. And you said that amount is two hundred thousand. I think it was fifty seven thousand okay. for the for the outside council. The outside. Yes. Thank you. So you were just citing a, a notable uptick in caseload workload coming into your office. Um, what do you attribute that to right now? Just the, the fact that this exists now? Do you, are you seeing the just curiosity is higher within the public sentiment or advocacy world, whomever, about understanding what's going on with officials? I think it's increased awareness of the ethics commission because um, the nature of the complaints haven't changed. Okay. The nature of the inquiries and the nature of the quest for guidance haven't changed. Just the fact that there's like an entity now for this purpose you're seeing in our curiosity inflow. Okay. Does anyone else have anything on this portion? Procedure and rulemaking. Procedure, unless otherwise controlled by statute or rules adopted by the Commission, the Vermont Rules of Civil Procedure, and the Vermont Rules of Evidence shall apply in the Commission's investigations and hearings. Rulemaking. The Commission shall adopt rules pursuant to 3 BSA Chapter 25 regarding procedural and evidentiary aspects of the Commission's investigations and hearings. Waiver of rules. Prevent unnecessary hardship, delay, or injustice, or for other good cause. Of two thirds of the commission's members present and voting may waive the application of a rule upon such conditions as the chair may require, unless precluded by rule or by statute. 
subpoenas and oaths, the commission, the executive director and the commission's legal counsel and investigators shall have the power to issue subpoenas and minister oaths in connection with any investigation or hearing, including compelling, compelling the provision of materials or the attendance of witnesses at any hearing, investigation or hearing. The commission, the executive director and the commission's legal counsel and investigators may take or cause depositions to be taken as needed in any investigation or hearing. Section 12. Representative Barry Evans. Thanks. Can you give us some examples of maybe other commissions or bodies that also have this kind of power to investigatory power to issue subpoenas and do similar kinds of? Sure. I think most of most, most, most of them, to be them? honest, yeah, okay. anyone that has, um, yeah, so I mean, anyone that has enforcement powers, I mean, we're, we, we're not at that level yet, but pretty right. much most of them, I think, do you need examples? We're going to say Connecticut. Massachusetts, Rhode Island for New England examples. I think we'll be looking more at cases where they don't have this power. That would be a shorter list. Do you want to define at all on this? Or... I'm just double checking to make sure this is nothing unusual okay. or no. revolutionary. Or no. 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 But yeah, it's pretty standard. Okay. Okay. But yeah. Apologies, I think I lost. Sorry. Track, but, oh no, my fault. Um, so I think it would be around waiver of rules to prevent unnecessary hardship, delay, or injustice, or for other cause, a vote of two thirds of the commission's members present vote may waive the application of a rule upon such conditions as the chair may require, unless precluded by rule or by statute. Subpoenas and oaths. The commission, the executive director, and the commission's legal counsel and investigators shall have the power to issue subpoenas and administer oaths in connection with any investigation or hearing including compelling the provision of materials or the attendance of witnesses at any investigation or hearing. The commission, the executive director, and the commission's legal counsel and investigators may take or cause depositions to be taken as needed in any investigation or hearing. Intent. It is the intent of this section both to protect the reputation of public servants pu from public disclosure, frivolous complaints against them, and to fulfill the public's right to know any unethical conduct committed by a public servant that results in issued warnings, reprimands or recommended actions. Public record, public records relating to the commission's handling of complaints, alleged unethical conduct, investigations, proceedings are exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act and shall be kept confidential, except those public records required if need to be released under this chapter. Records subject to public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act shall include investigation reports related to alleged unethical conduct determined to warrant a hearing pursuant to section 1227 of his title, but not any undisclosed records gathered or created in the course of the investigation. At the request of the public servant or the public servant's designated representative, investigation reports relating to alleged unethical conduct to determine not to warrant a hearing pursuant to section 1227 of his title, but not any undisclosed records gathered or created in the course of the investigation. So this is to give um, the respondent the opportunity to, um, to help them, I guess, clear their name or show that um, that there was, a, if they to show that there's a complaint that was filed against them. However, the facts did not lead to uh, the necessity of hearing. Necessity of hearing. Okay. Uh, evidence produced in the open and public portions of commission hearings, any warnings, reprimands, and recommendations issued by the commission, any executed resolution agreements, and any records of detail by the commission that support a warning, recommend, recommendation, or executed resolution agreement. For orders, nothing in this section shall prohibit the disclosure of any information regarding alleged unethical conduct pursuant to an order from a court of competent jurisdiction or to a state or federal law enforcement agency in the course of its investigation, provided the agency agrees to maintain the confidentiality of the information as provided in subsection B of this section. So uh, I think since we've done a walk through the language, what might be the most useful since we're going to have to switch gears pretty soon um, to take some testimony on a, a new draft of a different bill. Actually, um, Director Sivrit, if you could um, just talk to us generally about resolution agreements and sort of what those look like and at what point they, they kind of come in, because I think this is a new concept for me, um, and I'm sure most other folks on the committee. Sure, so resolution agreements are pretty common, and I'll say that um, we wanted to have the ability to resolve um, resolve complaints at the earliest opportunity, and so kind of took my inspiration or the inspiration for this or our model is um, 
the Human Rights Commission that also has the ability to enter into settlement agreements or mediation or resolution agreements at any stage in the process, including immediately after receipt of a complaint, or I think potentially um, a complaint inquiry before it rises to the level of like a formal filed complaint. I'm getting that from what I read, not from conversations with the Human Rights Commission, so I hope they forgive me if I got something wrong. But the idea here is just to take those complaints where there's an easy path to resolution and before going through the entire process using the resources, dragging it out, enter into an agreement. And so the agreements are between the ethics commission and the respondent, right? So the ethics commission is working on behalf of the state and the entire goal is to rectify the behavior that is likely, or in this case, we've pretty much determined that does actually violate the state code of ethics and to make improvements in the system to rectify the situation. So a resolution agreement um, would give us the ability to just resolve those complaints that are pretty clear on their face um, early on before we go through the entire process um, that would drag it out for, for the respondent and also you know, unnecessarily so. What would a, could you give an example of what a resolution agreement would look like? Yeah, so resolution agreements, I mean, they're pretty standard. There's um, a lot of examples out there, but if we're looking at it, it would just be, you know, looking at a summary of the facts, the summary of the facts that are agreed upon um, as applied to the, to the law, um, kind of a history of the complaint process, what has happened up to, up to this stage, and what the action steps are going to, what action steps are agreed upon in order to rectify the situation. And so what is the course of action that the respondent agrees to, what is the course of action that the respondent agrees to in order to resolve, um, resolve the issue? And so generally speaking, it has some kind of timeline, it has some specific steps laid out, and it really depends on the nature and how complicated the complaint was. So you could have a very simple complaint, um, say, where um, we, we commonly get complaints about preferential treatment. So you could say, you know, in this office, they are hiring people only from this one specific university. And so you can say, okay, we've received this complaint on its face. If this is true, then that is definitely a violation of the preferential treatment provision of the code of ethics. So in reaching out to the, the respondent to let them know this complaint has been filed, sharing the complaint with them, if they know that this is true, then the idea would be for them to say, okay, we understand the facts are accurate. We now understand that this is preferential treatment that we're engaged in that we shouldn't be engaged in. So we would discuss what are your steps to rectify the situation moving forward? Are there any remedial actions you need to take or could be taken um, to rectify situations that already happened, but the focus is on the future. And so moving forward, what will you do? Will you change internal written policies? Will you change you know, who you work with for recruitment, so on and so forth? And so how will that be implemented over you know, the next several months? And so once you come to an agreement, how that would work, it would be, you know, it would be an agreement that's signed by the respondent and also the members of the ethics commission. The water sentence. Thanks. And those would be publicly available, those resolution agreements. Yes. Yeah. Okay. For the, the incentive for the respondent, though, the person who the complaint was made against, the public official, would be to say, okay, yeah, I acknowledge that, you know, I, these are the steps I'm willing to take to make sure we can resolve this complaint. Um, and so that might be, you know, an office or a department saying we're going to change our hiring practice and we've implemented this. And then under this draft, they'd be required to check back in under the resolution agreement that, and it could have whatever kind of mechanism for making sure that that was closed. And what would happen if, in that instance, if, um, you know, the public official violated the terms of the resolution agreement? Then the process would pick back up where it started. And so, you know, the idea is to enter into a resolution agreement, you know, early on. Um, and so, for example, if this was even before we got to the investigation stage, if the, bio, if the um, agreement is violated, then you just, just pick back up, start the investigation, and then move forward from there. Any other questions about resolution agreements? That seems like a good tool to have in the toolbox might also avoid some of the more controversial pieces of hearings and things and give an opportunity for <laughs> the public yeah. official to... Well, and give an opportunity maybe if someone wasn't quite aware that there was a conflict of interest or profession or a preferential treatment or something like that to make the situation right. Yeah. That's their way. 
yeah, I, th I certainly think there are situations where people are engaged in behavior that may be common or maybe they just never thought of it in the context of ethics and specifically the code of ethics. So this gives them the opportunity to resolve the issue yeah. early on and show, show good faith. So um, we're going to pick this back up. I'm hoping uh, that we might actually schedule some time on Friday afternoon because we have to fill out uh, and there are a couple of things. I'm wondering, Tim, I don't know what your schedule is like on Friday at this point, but assuming that you are available, um, I'm sort of thinking that we, we might pick up our work on this at that point and incorporate some of the ideas here. Uh, but yeah, other questions, Representative Cooper? Just <clears throat> want to throw something out on the table that we might discuss next time. Tim and I have been having a discussion in the back room here. Um, I'm on several boards where to actually pass a motion, it's a quorum is established, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's enough votes when the majority votes to pass a motion. It's not those present and voting, it's those who are members of. So in this case, uh, the, the thing I posed was six member commission, four member quorum, four people show up for the meeting, quorum is met, you take a vote, three people say yes, one person says no, does the motion pass or fail? Under this language, it passes, but in, in the language where it says four members would be required to vote yes, because that's a majority of the entire body. Um, it's, a, it's a quirk, but it's also a difference in the standard of, let's say, conviction. If one person comes before the entire board, they have to uh, be found guilty, for lack of a better word by X number of people, where if somebody comes in with a diminished number of members present, it's a different standard for them to be actually found guilty or innocent. I'm bothered by that. What hundred? Well, what would be the resolution? Uh, other boards that I'm on, you have to have a majority of those appointed to the board. If it's a seven member board, what, four? Six member board in this case before. So the motion that was made where three people said yes and one person said no, it would fail rather than pass because you did not reach four, which is the quorum for the whole for the whole body. And again, the issue is a different standard of conviction. So I don't I'm not yeah, I mean I I I think that it, there's some merit in given that the seriousness of the findings could dramatically uh, impact uh, you know, the public's perception of a of a elected official, and then having a, a higher threshold for uh, yeah, the resolution of the case might make sense, and have there be a, you know a minimum of four votes required, but Director Silver is there. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't have a strong feeling either way, but. I would just be careful. So we have had situations in the past where commissioners had to recuse themselves. Um, and so we don't want to box ourselves into to a place where we um, are setting up a situation where we couldn't actually move forward. So we do have for example, several attorneys on the board, and we've had to have um, people recuse themselves because of you know cases they worked in the past. Um, we do have a new member who I believe does work for the district conduct board. Uh, so just you know scenarios where we could have somebody uh, more than one person who needs to recuse themselves. Also, if we're saying we need four people, um, majority of four people. So right now we have five commissioners, we are moving into a situation where we have six. So I'll just point out, you know, currently if we weren't changing the makeup of the commission because we're adding the Brunt League of Cities and Towns and that's because of the initial ethics piece, we would be at a place where we would always be looking for three. Um, so just to keep that in mind that like right now with, this, with the setup of the commission, if it weren't changing and it's only changing because of the municipal ethics piece, 
um, three would be sufficient. And I don't think that that's would be an unusual standard. TJ, do you want to weigh in? Um, sure. I mean, the the ethics commissions are typically different than a lot of other uh, agencies. Um, first is the appointment structure that they're appointed by a, a whole bunch of different bodies. And sometimes those appointments don't come through in a timely way. The second is the, um, the importance of recusal uh, becomes more acute on an ethics board. And you want to encourage people, even if they have the slightest appearance of a conflict to be able to opt out, knowing that the vote can go forward uh, in their absence. Um, if you change the structure of voting, you provide uh, a, an incentive for those people who are on the fence as to whether they should recuse themselves to uh, participate in the vote simply so that the vote can take place if it, their recusal would be in the absence of a quorum. And so it puts uh, officials appointed to the board in, in a quandary in situations where, from a legal perspective, they don't have a conflict of interest, but um, from a public appearance perspective, they want to recuse themselves to uh, take away any perceived taint from the decision. Uh, TJ, that's, if I may. Oh, yes, please. That's, I think, not my issue. My issue is somebody goes in on a Tuesday and there are four members present and somebody goes in on a Thursday and there are six members present. Uh, one person gets found guilty by three. One person gets found guilty by four. Uh, that's inconsistent. And I don't think it should be inconsistent. I understand. Um it's a it's a situation that is faced by many commissions um, that are subject to a standard. Most most of these commissions opt for a present and voting standard um, to take into account um, a variety of situations. So it would end up being inconsistent in the sense that a majority of five is less than a majority of seven but it would end up being consistent in that the percentages will always reign true. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I think this rise, because of the subject matter you're dealing with and the people that you're dealing with, I think this might be considered rising to a higher level than do we spend 50 bucks on donuts this month? Um, the, 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 the determination of this group is potentially, you know, depending upon how serious the allegation is, significant. That's all I have to say. So, Representative Nugent, then okay, go ahead. It, um, it, it makes me think that there, this probably happens in other cases that there are people who have to recuse themselves from votes where. The quorum is required of the entire like body. I don't know if that's true or not, or if we could like make an exception. But I see your point, and I, I feel like it sort of resonates with me. So I wonder, yeah, what happened? Well, maybe wonder for a while. I won't take a time. I guess what I would say is um, that maybe we can work offline legislative council to look at how other. Um, quasi judicial boards handle the quorum versus vote requirements and see if there's uh, an example there. I could, I'm starting to, to think of if the real issue is that we don't want to set, you know, four out of six as the threshold mm -hmm. uh, in the event that, say, two members have to recuse themselves. So it's not just a casual reason that there aren't happen to not be a couple of members there. There's a, a cause for the inconsistency um, that for, you know, that for the final findings that we, you know, might make it a majority of the board instead of majority of the members present, you know, uh, who have not had to recuse themselves or something like that, where it's not just an absence of the member, it's an actual recusal. And that way, what that would force the, the board to do if we, if we made it contingent that way was to schedule the vote for a time when all the members who hadn't recused themselves could actually be present. 
also just mentioned that the way the commission is set up, it's pretty unique in the sense that a lot of community organizations um, appoint members to the commission. And uh, one requirement for some of them is that the uh, appointed member has to be a member of that organization. So for example, we did have a situation last year, we had a commissioner resign and it took several months to fill the position because you're dealing with like a small, uh, an organization that has a small number of members and they're trying to find the person who's willing to devote the time to be a volunteer member of the board. And it's not that, always that easy to do. I think we can wordsmith this to address the concern Representative Hooper, but I, I think it is a, a valid one. Um, great, so I think we've gotten a few more things on the table today, introduced and delved into a couple of new concepts. Uh, I would, I think the use of that Friday afternoon block that's opened up would be good for us to, to take a look um, further if Tim is available and uh, and obviously Director Sivra and TJ, if you're available on Friday, we could pick this back up at one. Uh, what I'd like to do <laughs> is give the committee a little bit of a break before we pick up 641 with Tucker. All right, uh, good morning again. Uh, welcome back to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. Uh, we are switching our attention now to um, the latest draft of H641, our bill about hearing uh, abatements as class. And Tucker has a new draft for us, which is posted on our committee page. Struggle. This is one point two. That's struggle. Yes, draft one point two. All right, there are three changes from draft 1.1 as you reviewed it yesterday. And for the record, Tucker Anderson, Legislative Council. Um, the first two instances of amendment are the updated day counts. So if you look in subdivision E2 on page two, you will notice that the board shall provide notice to each of the taxpayers at a minimum 21 days before the scheduled hearing for the class. The deadline for uh, the response has been updated to seven days on the taxpayer, seven days before the hearing. So seven and 21. Okay. The other change is also within subdivision E2. So you'll note right after that sentence we just covered. Um, it says that the notice shall include a description of the class and the board's reasons for grouping the requests. This is what you had asked for yesterday, some sort of description for the taxpayer to understand why the board is going to group the requests and what the class is. Those are the changes from yesterday's version. Happy to certain questions, walk through this again, whatever the committee needs. Are there questions? I think just reading this, um, or shall provide notice to each taxpayer 21 days before the scheduled hearing. So the timeline is 21 days before the hearing, they have 14 days to opt out, and that gives uh, at least a couple of days for the Board of Abatement and the clerk to get the paperwork together. And it was shown with the description of the class and the board's reasons for grouping the requests. I think that does the job. Thank you, Tucker, for getting our abstract thoughts into some actual language. I have a question. Go ahead. It is almost beside me around it. I'm just curious why in number two it says at minimum 21 days before the scheduled hearing. And in section three, it says a minimum of seven days before the board's hearing. Is that two ways of saying the same thing or do they mean something different? It is two ways of saying the same thing and something that we should have caught in editing, but not enough of a... Uh, significant departure from the drafting manual that require an immediate correction. Two ways of saying the same thing. Great, thanks. 
I'm just curious. If there's an opportunity to look at this again in the near future, we'll make it consistent. Not in consistent. Consistent. Yeah, consistent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love a good callback. <laughs> Appreciate that. Are there any outstanding questions, concerns? Um, I think that on balance, what we've done here is to create a set of guardrails, a timeline. We're giving a reasonable ability for boards of abatement to group like cases, uh, but we're giving an opportunity for those taxpayers to opt out if they want to be heard individually. Uh, and it'll be up to them to weigh the pros and cons of that. But I think we are adding enough information into the notice that's required to be given to those requesting abatement that they'll be able to make that decision effectively. Does anyone have any objection to us going ahead and and moving this forward today? Any last questions for Tucker? I will just note that I did confirm yesterday that there's another bill dealing with abatement, uh, H629, that House Ways and Means is working on and to the maximum extent possible and made sure that this version would at least conform. There are some overlapping provisions, such as H629. Uh, there is a proposal to include H19 in that as well. But uh, Kirby, Keaton, and I will make sure that however these proposals move forward, that there's a harmonization a harmonization between the two bills. I really deeply appreciate that. Uh, I know this bill's, uh, I would say, slightly less substantive than <laughs> what they're considering doing up there. Representative Haley. So, Chair, I had a conversation with Carol Doss myself yesterday, and um, it was an interesting conversation, and I'm I'm certainly willing to to support what we're trying to do here. But I mentioned to her uh, as well um, that I I think it's going to be a um, uh, tough task for no, maybe not tough, but uh, uh, the clerks are going to have to really probably uh, take a lot of calls as far as just just what's going on here. I mean, I think the information that's going out there isn't you know, prescriptive enough to have the taxpayers understand exactly what they might be getting into. So I just, mm -hmm. I just want to, again, I'm supportive, but I, I've got a feeling that, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of confusion out there. And, I, and I, I'm absolutely willing to give it a shot, but uh, I, I hope, I hope for the best. Mm -hmm. Representative Murray, just to follow up on that. Uh, yeah, I don't got that. Uh, that can happen. Uh, BCAs have enough uh, to do with on a regular basis, you know, as volunteers. But I also hope maybe VLCT can help with uh, training and uh, keeping people up to date on that. And, and they do a great job, I should say, you know, whether it's for select board people or other other uh, municipal committee members, they VLCT does a great job. And I know. Uh, but they've been helpful with our JPs and PCA. So hopefully that will continue. And just to follow up again, you know, one of one of the things is, you know, the board of abatement doesn't doesn't necessarily have to go out and 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 view this. And and that's that's to me gonna be a tough one for them. You don't have to go out and see whether or not house is totally destroyed or partially destroyed. It's it's basically basically on the investigative and hearing process to understand that. But it's a lot different than, uh, you know, what we've been through is uh, sometimes uh, a family might have a, a family catastrophe and, and we understand that um, we, we paid a certain amount, whatever it is, sometimes it's a fire. That's pretty obvious, you know, that we just the garage burn and the whole house burns, you know, so but it's a little different than so many uh, issues around whether it's a mudslide or, Flooding, and, and I think even uh, Chris Delia mentioned it yesterday with Cambridge, where you know you've got one house that's got basement flooded, and the next house has got a foot in the upstairs first floor, and 
next house is even different than that. So it's, yeah, but again, I'm, I'm hoping for the best. Mm -hmm. Thanks. One of the things that tipped me early on in this discussion into wanting to have the committee actually really dive into this and, and work on the bill some more was uh, the testimony that we had heard that said there's some, some towns that are probably already de facto doing this um, and to actually lay out some notice requirements and to put some meat on the, the bones of <laughs> what's the, there's not a whole lot that uh, is in statute around what boards of abatement have to do other than the specific criteria for abatement. Um, so um, on balance, I think we've, we're have we going to see an improvement here, but it's going to be interesting to see, you know, and I'll be interested to hear back from some of the, the towns that do decide to take advantage of this in cases where there's been an event like what we're seeing in Barry. Uh, Representative Mulligy. Um, are we ready for a vote? I would entertain a motion that we find the strap favorable. I will offer that motion <clears throat> to, uh, to approve 8641 as prevented, as presented so able. Are there any further comments? Clerk shall commence the call the roll. Representative Byron? Yes. Representative Boyden? Yes. Representative Pango? Yes. Representative Morgan? Yes. Representative Cooper Burlington? Yes. Representative Murphy? Yes. Representative Chase? Yes. Representative Waters Evans? Yes. Representative Cooper Randolph? Representative Nugent? Yes. <clears throat> Representative Pigley? Yes. Representative McCarthy? Yes. 1101. Would you have any interest in reporting this? I don't want to force it on you, but I hadn't, I hadn't thought that through. Sure, I can. Yeah. Yeah, so if, since Representative Higley has kindly offered to <laughs> do that, I think your experience with boards of abatement and some of the local municipal uh, issues that are relevant here would be really valuable in That's case people have questions. Okay. Let me know if there's anything you need on the floor. Okay. Uh, this will probably be noticed tomorrow. It'll probably take a swing through ways and means. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so it won't be coming too yeah. fast and furious. And they've got a couple other things that work. And I can imagine they want to take a peek at this one. Yeah. Um, all right, committee. Well, that was a pretty efficient use of our time. So um, I'm going to use this little time before lunch to try to make a plan for um, some of the things that we're going to be doing with the ethics bill. Um, we will be back here at 1 o'clock. And, and we're going to be here at 6 06. So and we'll be doing a little bit of um, hearing about H606 and we'll be uh, returning for some testimony from OPR and the Vermont Medical Society about um, the OPR uh, bill. So that'll be our afternoon. I'll see you all back at one. We'll adjourn and go off live. Awesome.